So then just some fun about me, my keywords is Disney, the cloud, dogs, veggies. I love Linux. And somehow along the way, I got all involved in distributed databases, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's what I've been pretty much focusing on for the last six years is distributed databases. Also big data, analytics, testing, and running. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? So what problems are we actually trying to solve? So that's what we're going to kind of talk about in our overview. Then we're going to talk about what exactly is Apache Cassandra. So just a quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of Cassandra? Exactly. But how much would you say you know about it? Like, you've heard of it, sure, but do you know a lot about it? Like, thumbs up if you're like, yeah, I'm a total expert, Cassandra. OK, cool. Then this talk is for you. So we're going to talk what it is and why you might need it. Because with Cassandra and any kind of distributed database, it's not necessarily something that everyone needs for every project. So we're going to talk about what it is and when you would need it. And then you can kind of decide in the future for your projects whether you think you need it. Then we're going to talk about very brief uh, introduction to Apache Spark because we're going to be using Spark a little bit, and we have very tight integrations between Cassandra and Spark with data stacks. So we're going to talk about what it is. Again, why would you need it? Because again, not every project needs these type of technologies. Then a very brief introduction to what is sentiment analysis. Then what is data stacks enterprise analytics? How does it help us in this domain? Then we're going to do an overview of the demo, and then we're going to set up and play with the demo on your laptops with Docker. So what problem are we really trying to solve? What movie should I see? <laughs> That's the overarching, what are we trying to do? So wouldn't it be great if I could ask 1 million people this question? And wouldn't it be great if I could automate this process, that I could actually do this myself? So long and short of it, data analytics does not have to be complicated. To analyze things, it doesn't have to be all these complicated workflows. It can just be something as simple as like, I want to do some text analytics on Twitter tweets. So we're going to utilize the power of big data with Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark, Spark machine learning libraries, Jupyter Notebooks, Python, uh, Twitter tweets and the Twitter API. Actually, in this case, so I have a notebook for you later that you can review that you can actually, I show you how to set up a Twitter dev account so that you can actually pull live Twitter tweets using their API with Python. Um, we won't do that today because it takes a little bit of time to actually apply for that. So I show you how to do that and then in the future, or even later today, if we have time, you could start work, walking through that. And we have a notebook that'll help guide you through that. But in this case, we're just going to use boring uh, CSV files from Twitter tweets that I pulled in advance and then just load them to CSV files. But so we're getting part of the way there. And then we're going to use a Python package called Pattern for the actual sentiment analysis. OK, so what exactly is Apache Cassandra? So Apache Cassandra was first developed by Facebook in 28, or 2008. And then they open sourced it, and it became an incubator Apache project. And then two years later, it graduated to a top level project. Now, like I said, I'm an Apache committer on another project. So I know how complicated and how like, stringent and serious that uh, the Apache Foundation takes these types of projects and allowing them to actually graduate to top level. So the fact that Cassandra was able to do that in two years really shows the community that they have behind it. So there's a lot of different people from a lot of different companies. If you're not familiar with the Apache model, there's a lot of people from a lot of different companies that all contribute to the same project. So DataStax has a majority of the contributors to Cassandra, but also places like Apple um, and Facebook. Uh, I think even some folks at Amazon, they also contribute to the project. So what is it exactly? So now we kind of know the history. But it is a distributed, decentralized database. So um, the kind of you see in big bold there, distributed. This is a distributed database. So we're going to run this database on our laptops, but that's not the use case. You don't use this database when you have small amounts of data. You use it when you have large amounts of data. So it's elastically scalable. You can add or remove nodes with no downtime. There's high performance. It's very fast. High availability and fault tolerant. There's no single point of failure. We're going to talk about why. That's kind of a, that's a cool word, and that sounds fun. That's a nice phrase. But why is it actually no single point of failure? We're going to talk about it in a minute. Um, and it solves many of the problems faced with traditional databases for certain types of workloads. Again, it doesn't fit every use case. So what is DataStax Enterprise? So that's the company I work for. So just, I just like to just bring this up just so that people know the difference between the two. Basically, DataStax Enterprise is the production-ready version of Apache Cassandra. So there's more interesting stuff there, but I won't bore you with the details. So what does this all mean? 
So let's talk about the four big topics of what a distributed database, what it is, especially a database like Cassandra. So it's distributed, the replication, elastically scalable, and it has high availability. And I just put another note here. Don't forget, this is just a brief intro. So again, it has to be distributed to be able to handle big data. So every node in the cluster has the same role. They really do. There's no master worker architecture in Cassandra. So any client can connect, connect to any node, and it's able to do this for reads and writes. Um, there's, not, there's not nodes for reads, there's not nodes for writes, there's not a master node, there's not a client node. All the nodes are exactly the same. But this is not to say that all the nodes contain all the data. Right? That's, that's not very scalable. So that's how we get into the replication factor. So to be able to survive a node going down, because when we think about these distributed clusters, they're going to have not just one node, not just two nodes. They may, I think the largest deployment of Cassandra that's at Apple has like over 7,000 nodes. So nodes will go down. They're going to fail. So you have to have your data replica replicated across nodes so that um, when one node goes down, your data is still available. So you can set this by the user. Uh, the user can set the replication factor. So it can be anywhere from one up to three. Um, or, or actually, it could go all the way up to the number of nodes that you have in your cluster, but that's not really recommended. So we always say it's just up to three. Because the fact that the likelihood of three of your nodes going down that all contain the exact same copy of the data that was randomly distributed all going down at the same time, it's very unlikely. So again, the data is automatically replicated. You just write once, and then Cassandra takes care of the rest, and it replicates it across the, the cluster. So again, it's automatic, and it's peer-to-peer -peer communication. So you can see here, the nodes can talk to, any node can talk to any other node. And that's why you only need to talk to one node, and then it'll just get it out to the other nodes. Elastically scalable. So this is an interesting thing about Cassandra, is that the more nodes you add, your performance will actually increase linearly. You can scale up and scale down with no downtime. You don't even need a restart, which actually I was really surprised by. So not only can you, not only can you add the nodes, but you can also add the nodes with no downtime at all, with no restart. And both reads and writes both scale. So like I said, I've worked on quite a few different distributed databases, and I worked on one for a while that I was actually working on getting all the configuration so that we could actually add nodes. So we didn't even have the capability. We couldn't even add nodes. So I was helping work on that. That was great. We finally had the ability to add the nodes in. We could see it all across the cluster. If you did a count, you could see, you know, okay, now I have 10 nodes. But we were running it, and we were saying, we're not getting, like we see with Cassandra, we're not getting an increase in performance. Now, not only we're not getting linear increase, but we're not getting any. Well, lo and behold, the more we worked through it, uh, we had some hard-coded values deep down in the code. Because somewhere along the line, somebody thought, well, there's no way that anybody will ever have more than 50 nodes. <laughs> so you're not going to have that kind of problem with Cassandra. So high availability. So again, this kind of database is for an application that you need that needs to be always on. So the lack of the master nodes allows for high availability. There is no single point of failure. And then replication allows nodes to fail and the data to still be available. So Cassandra expects nodes to fail and it doesn't panic. It was built with this in mind. It's ready for this to happen. Also, um, right out of the box, with the, again, with high availability, we have multiple data center support right out of the box. So you can have multiple data, we call them data centers, that's a little bit of Cassandra terminology. So we have nodes, which are the individual um, servers. And then from there, what I would probably call a cluster, they call it data center, which is a collection of locally connected nodes. And then out from there, you have a larger cluster that has multiple data centers within it. And the different data centers could be um, in different regions. So say um, you could have it across US, different AWS availability zones, um, even we have multi-cloud support as well. So here's just one small trade-off I wanted to bring up to everyone, because all the kind of things I've just said to you make Cassandra and Datastax sound very magical. Um, but nothing's magical, right? And again, I'm a developer advocate, so I'm not here to sell anybody anything, or I have no interest in any of that. So I want to bring up this interesting uh, uh, part of trade-off about Datastax and Cassandra. And so that's around the fact that it is an eventually consistent database. So that means that you may not have your data the same across all nodes. 
And so this is all around the CAP theorem, which this is just for, uh, you should do a little Googling on this. It's kind of interesting. Basically, you can't have all of these things at the same time. You can't have availability consisting of partitioning when your nodes go down, when there is a network failure. You can't have all these things at the same time. When everything's running smoothly and running perfectly, you can. Um, so it's really impossible to have all these things. And so because of that, Cassandra chooses to have eventual consistency. So, but you can prioritize this in your queries um, over availability. So the consistency levels are configurable. So even though it is an eventually consistent database, you can tune it uh, per query to actually be a consistent database. So I just bring that up to make sure everybody knows that we're all being completely straightforward and honest here. Okay, so let's get to the piece about why you might need this. Why would this be something your application needs? So do you have big data? Do you have a lot of it? Do you need to be able to read and write very fast? Do you need to be able to scale up and scale down very easily? Do you need high availability? Do you need multi-data center support or multi-cloud, multi hybrid cloud, all the different ways that you can deploy something? If you need that kind of support, then you might want to consider using a database like Cassandra or Cassandra. All right, so let's get into our small introduction to Apache Spark. So I don't know how many in the room have actually used Spark before. Okay, cool. Oh, nice. Okay, so we're going to play just a tiny bit with it today. Uh, good. Okay, nice. So Apache Spark is a, so I just took this straight from their website because it's a really great definition. So somebody obviously was like working really hard like to try to like actually get this perfect explanation of what it is that they do, um, which is not easy to do. So Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. So that's that key word there is analytics engine. So it's 100 times faster than Hadoop for analytics, and that's because it utilizes in-memory in -member, in processing. And it has amazing parallelism. So not only does uh, Spark have the machine learning libraries that we're going to utilize today, it also has, the, it, it has Spark SQL, Spark Streaming, again, the Spark machine learning libraries, uh, GraphX for like a graph uh, database type engine to do graph analytics, and Spark R to do R work. So again, this is super quick touch on what Spark is, but why would you need Spark? Why would you want to use that? Um, it's pretty obvious because of the machine learning libraries why you'd want to use Spark um, if, if you're doing that kind of analysis. That's pretty crystal clear. But if you're not doing that, you know, it may not be clear to why you might need it. So again, if you have big data. So this is not for just small sets of data. This is not just for things that fit on your laptop, right? If you need high availability, if you need analytics at lightning speed, and um, if you want to do, you need some simple ways to get some insights into your data. Now, again, for this crowd, the PyData crowd, come on in. Um, you're well aware of doing simple ways to get insights into your data. You use Python to do these things, right? Um, but not everybody does, and so they can actually utilize Spark to do some of this and PySpark, which is what we're going to do later. All right, so if you need any of these things, you might want to consider using Apache Spark. OK, what is sentiment analysis? OK, so this, again, very light touch on what this is. Um, I have a few friends who are professors in data science, and they'd probably be really unhappy with me that I only have one slide for sentiment analysis. But nevertheless, we don't need to know all the math behind it. Um, we just kind of need to know that sentiment analysis at a high level is just a very simple way to do uh, natural language processing and text analytics to determine um, things about a word or a sentence. So we're trying to determine whether the sentence is positive, negative, or neutral. Or actually in the, the Python package that we're going to be using, it doesn't really tell us neutral. It just kind of says, like, I don't know. Um, I don't really know what you're trying to tell me. So this is very easy for us to understand at a high level. But it's really difficult for machines to learn how to do. And just think it's even difficult for just us now in the text age to understand what people are trying to say to us, right? Think of those times when somebody sends you a text and it just says, OK, it's just a period at the end. And you're like, OK, well, are they happy with me? Are they sad with me? What, like, what's the problem? So it's hard for us to interpret these things. So teaching a computer is also extremely difficult. But with some of these techniques that we're going to work on today, you'll see how we can do this. Okay, 
so this was awesome, right? We have an understanding of these different technologies now, but now what? Okay, so these are just a few things, uh, different ways that you can uh, learn more about these things if you have uh, interest in that in the future. So you can learn more about Cassandra at, um, we have a free, it's kind of like Coursera, it's called DataStax Academy. It has tons of free classes. All you have to do is register um, about Cassandra, DataStax, Spark, Basically, anything you want to know about distributed databases, you could go there and learn more about it. Um, also, another good place to learn about Spark is just from their website there. Again, you can learn more about DataStax on our website. Um, I tweet sometimes interesting things, sometimes not interesting things, but you can follow me on Twitter. And also, we, recently we started a Twitch. Um, so one of my coworkers, uh, he's been twitching just things as he goes along and tries to like get things up and running, kind of like what we're doing today he would just put on Twitch. So it's kind of, it's actually more entertaining than you think to watch. Okay, so let's start working on an overview of the demo. And so once we go through that, then we can kind of get you all up and running and started with that. Okay, so we're gonna analyze Twitter with DSE Analytics and Jupyter. So first off, and again, like I said, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna walk through this, um, just the notebook, so we know what we're doing. Then we're gonna switch over to you all doing it yourselves. So we're going to install Docker. Now, of course, I already have it installed on my laptop, but that's kind of the path that we're going to take. You're going to install Docker. Then you're going to install and run uh, DataStax Enterprise, and it also has Jupyter included with it. So you don't have to do two installations. Just in the Docker container, everything's there. Then from there, we're actually going to open up the notebooks, and we're going to start walking through it. So from there, we're going to create a database, or we call it a key space. We're going to create tables. We're going to insert our data into Cassandra. We're going to, and also I should mention that we're also going to pull down these notebooks um, from GitHub. Uh, so I'll show you, I'll point you all to where you can get these notebooks. Uh, we're going to create a Spark data frame. Then we're going to use Spark machine uh, libraries to do some of the sentiment analysis. Then we're going to pass that over to Pandas with pattern, and that's going to finally give us that positive and negative. We're going to take an average of these scores, and then we're going to decide hey, should I see this movie? Okay, so now it's hands-on time. So let me switch over to my notebook. So I'll come back to these instructions here once I kind of walk through the notebook. Okay, so here's my Jupyter instance. I'll make this larger. So here we are in the, um, the notebooks directory. So it's just automatically, once you'll see, once you start it, you'll see it just to, automatically take you to the notebooks directory. We also have a, a folder with our data, uh, and that's where you can see, like, this is where I've brought them into CSV files. Let's go back here. We have some images, just so that we can show some nice images in the notebook. Um, then I have some more information about installation. That was kind of what I was talking about. Oops, let me go back here. Sorry about that. Um, that's where you can get more information to actually set up that Twitter API so you can actually start pulling live Twitter um, data um, on any search term that you have. And I can walk, if anybody's interested in actually getting that set up, uh, later when we're just walking on this, working on this together, just raise your hand and I can come over and like, help you if it's, it's a little bit confusing, but it's, uh, once you do it the first time, you kind of know how to do it forever. And then we have a notebook here that actually has, um, this is the other notebook that actually will use those Twitter API to pull live data. So let's start walking through this one. So this is the one that we're gonna focus on the most. So this is a demo using DataStax Enterprise, Cassandra, Spark, Py Python, Jupyter Notebooks, Twitter Tweets, Python Pattern, and Sediment Analysis. So it's a lot of things all wrapped up into one because that's kind of one of my favorite things is I love seeing how you can integrate different technologies all together um, to do something, in this case, kind of fun and not so difficult, not difficult to understand at all. So some of the things that we'll need to set up, um, so you're gonna work through actually another notebook that'll help you with that setup process and I'll show you that at the end here. So we're gonna work through the installation of DSE and Jupyter Notebook for the setup instructions. And like I said, on your free time, try to get the Twitter dev API up and running, and you can use, utilize the other notebook for this. So this example, we use the CSV files. So just here, and uh, we're, gonna, we're just gonna run this. So here, this is just something I have to, this is actually a bug <laughs> that um, I've actually passed back to one of our developers, and he's actually already fixed it in one of our later releases. But basically, you just have to tell um, uh, Python or PySpark 
utilize the Pi Spark that's within DSE, which is DataSax Enterprise, because like I said, um, they're co-located. So utilize this, don't try to utilize any other one that you may have. And then just append that. And so then we're gonna import some of our Python packages here. And okay, so everyone's gonna get this error, just ignore it. <laughs> and just run it again and it's fine. So let's talk about some of the things that we're actually gonna use. We're gonna use pandas. Uh, we're gonna use the Cassandra driver, the Python driver to connect from, um, uh, with Python to Cassandra to the database. We're gonna use PySpark and we're gonna utilize this PySpark that's within DataStax. We're gonna use regular expressions, um, the OS uh, library. We're gonna use some display, again, markdown, right? So we can have these nice, uh, nice markdown here. And then just some of the things from the uh, PySpark tokenize, uh, stop word remover, and we'll talk about that as we go along. So then just here, I just have a nice helper function to just kind of like make the Spark data frames uh, display a little bit nicer. All right, so we're gonna create the tables and then we're gonna load the tweets. So here we're just creating a uh, cluster session, basically it's saying connect to my database and then give me a session back. So I'll run that. And then we're gonna create, so again, in uh, Cassandra and DataStax, instead of a database, we call it a key space. And that's where all our tables will live under that. So we're gonna create one, we're gonna call it demo one. And then as you can see here, this is what I was talking about before with this replication factor. So now in this case, because we're not working on a distributed systems per se, right? We're working on a single node. We don't need to set the replication factor to anything other greater than one, since we're only gonna have one node. And then we just sit here so we don't have to keep referencing it. Okay, so now this is where stuff gets to get, start to get a little bit fun. So set the movie title variable. So you can change this to search for different movies. So even with the CSV file for, uh, format that we're using here, I've loaded multiple of those. Um, so you're able to look between Mamma Mia 2, First Man, A Star is Born, and Mission Impossible. So actually, I have A Star is Born, but I'm gonna change it to Mission Impossible. So let's run that there. So that just sets the movie title so that we don't have to keep, uh, keep, we can just use that throughout. So then we just have a list here of positive and negative um, because something interesting I learned, and I think I talk about this a little bit later. So Twitter actually, when you're pulling from the API, um, it actually will do a first pass at trying to do sentiment analysis. So if you ser have a search term that you give it with a smiley face, it will try to pull all your posit positive tweets it has about that search term. And if you have a sad face, literally a sad face, it pulls all the negative tweets. So it actually already tries to do a first pass at that. So that's, we're kind of utilizing that and building on that um, to be able to pull positive and negative tweets. Um, but what you'll see here, and I think you'll see um, as well, it does a really good job of pulling positive tweets. It's very good at finding that sentiment, but it's really rocky and I would almost say it doesn't work for the negative. I, I don't know if it's just something that used to work and now doesn't work. And I mean, this is a free service, so maybe they're not that worried about it, but it's, it's just interesting and it's something for us to play with as we play with these notebooks. So we're gonna create two tables in Cassandra for the movie titles, one for negative tweets and one for positive tweets. So um, Twitter actually returns a lot of information. And if you, get, um, if you get that API set up for yourself, you'll see that it pulls way more information than you probably ever thought it would. Um, it's kind of nerve wracking. <laughs> because it actually pulls the Twitter ID, so that's unique to each person who tweets, and then it tweets, it gives you all this other information back about them, geolocation, um, followers, friends, everything. Um, but in this case, we don't really need all that extra information, even though um, for you in the future, doing analysis, that may be information that you actually do want. But for us, all we really need is a unique ID to partition our data by, and the tweet. So we create a table here, so if it doesn't exist, uh, create a table with columns of a big int for the Twitter ID and a text column uh, for the tweet. And then our primary key is around that Twitter ID. So Cassandra needs a primary key when it partitions the data, and that key must be unique, which we're lucky with the Twitter ID that it is unique. All right, then let's load the Twitter tweets. Pull from Twitter and store in a CSV file. Um, these are pulled from Twitter, so I did this in advance. 
So basically we're gonna, let's make sure I run this. I didn't create my table yet. All right. So basically it just opens up the file and then it goes per line. And then what it's gonna do is just insert it. So you see this insert statement here and that'll insert that into Cassandra. All right, and it's pretty fast, which is nice. So we loaded the negative ones, so now we can load the positive ones. So now we can do a select star on each table and verify that the tweets have actually been inserted. So let's Okay, cool. So we see they both were inserted, both the positive and the negative tweets were loaded. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're actually gonna start doing some analytics. We're gonna, do, uh, we're gonna use Apache Spark. doing here in this table this is going to take actually a little bit to run um, I'm connecting into um, I'm connecting between Cassandra and Spark so I'm saying okay I want a Spark session connect to my master that lives in data stacks and then from there I'm going to make a connection uh, with the table so I want to pull that information all that information from that Cassandra table and I want to make that into a Spark data frame so we now have two Spark data frames, one with table with positive tweets and one with table with negative tweets. And so just to make sure that this, that this actually happened, right? Um, again, with Spark, it has lazy execution. So it doesn't actually do anything until you give it an action. So, in this, so this isn't enough of an action to create a data frame. Whoops. Um, let me just fix this so in case we need that later. <laughs> Okay. So doing this count and doing like a select, select count star on that will actually give us that count. So in this case, again, like I said, we don't have big data. This is small data. So we have 50 columns or 50 rows in our positive and 75 in our negative. So now we're actually going to tokenize this up. We need to break up these sentences into individual words because pattern the Python uh, library that we're going to use later, it can't just take a whole sentence. It needs you to chop it up. So that's pretty simple. And we're utilizing the power of Spark. Now, again, you all know that we could have also done this probably with the probably numerous Python packages that could have, and Python libraries that could have done this. But we're utilizing Spark because, again, even though this is just on one node and we do only have, you know, 50 rows, but if we had big data, if we had, you know, 100 nodes with terabytes of data, we could use this exact same command with Spark. And honestly, it would take similar amount of time that it's taking on the small bit of data for much larger bits of data. So just keep that in mind. A lot of this is not something that you necessarily would use on your laptop, but if you have a large scale application, this might be something you want to use. Okay, so we've broken it up into individual words. Not, I mean, we printed it here in a nice data frame. Um, nice output, but it's nothing quite interesting yet. We are getting a number of tokens, so a number of words per sentence, uh, but nothing that interesting. So now is when we're starting to get something a little bit interesting. So now we're going to remove all the stop words. So basically what we're saying, I don't, stop words are anything like of, a, the, all those other little words. We're going to just strip those out because we're going to say, okay, I don't want to get, I don't want pattern when it's doing its sentiment analysis to get confused. So let's do that. And so what's nice about this, so as you can see, this is just three lines of code that's doing that for us. That's um, creating this new data frame with the stop, uh, with the addition of a column of the um, words that are tokenized, but removing the stop words. And so we're gonna print those out here. So we have the original tweet, then we have the tokenized words, just the words. Then we have the stop words actually removed and then we have a count of the original number of words that were in the sentence. And now that we've removed the stop words, how many words are actually there? So you can already start to see it's, it's a little bit interesting. I mean, again, we have a small data set here, but we can already see that they removed, we, we've gotten rid of quite a few words here. So in this case, there was originally 20 words in the sentence, and now there's only 12. Okay, so now I think this is what this crowd came for, which is actually using the Python package pattern with, for sentiment analysis. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to convert the Spark data frame to a pandas data frame. Now, I just want to let everybody know this works as is because we're working on a small data set on our laptop. Now, if I was working, like I said, in those large scale applications, you can't just take a Spark data frame and then just put it into a pandas. 
timeframe, unless the server that Pandas is running on is very large, has a lot of memory. Um, so it's not something that you just do, you don't want to take a subset, uh, because otherwise uh, it's, not, it's going to overload your memory and crash your computer. <laughs> All right. So from here, we're going to do a loop <coughs> and get the sentiment score. So anything that is positive is positive. Anything negative or zero is negative. So there's a positive function here. Let me see if I can highlight it for you. This here <coughs> will tr return true if the tweet is actually positive. And then there's an assessment function that will show you which words were used to judge and score each of the words. So this is a little confusing right here, but if we just run it, we can easily see. Okay, so it prints out here in a nice data frame. Okay, so here's the original tweet, and here's our sentiment score. So again, these are negative tweets, so the fact that we're getting negative uh, scores is good, right? That's what we were expecting. So we see our score here. Then we see whether it was positive or negative, a true or false, and in this case, false, it's not positive, right? Which again, what we were expecting. And then here's the assessment. This is where it, um, it's actually fun to start playing with these things, and when you when you walk through this yourself, you can try the different movies and see if you're getting different results. So in this case, we're seeing something interesting, right? So we search for the movie Mission Impossible. So when it takes an assessment of what are the words that it used to actually determine the sentiment of the statement, we're seeing something not great. We're seeing the word impossible. It's utilizing that word and saying, Oh, impossible. That's a negative word. That's not a positive word. So I'm going to score this really low. Um, I'm going to say this was a very negative sentiment. Um, and just the and also it's very negative, right? 0 0.6. Uh, that's really close to like that's extremely negative. So look, you can see sad is 0 0.5. So impossible is even more of a negative word than sad. <laughs> okay. So we have all those scores there. So now let's do some for positive here. Okay, so we're doing the same thing. We have our original tweet. Uh, let's see if we can find one. Okay, let's see if we can find one that's really, really positive. Okay, well I can't seem to find one right now, but we can, when we're walking through it individually, you can try that out. But anyways, here's our original tweet. Here's our sentiment score. Um, so we're getting whether it's, uh, if it's positive or negative. So in this case, we're mostly seeing true. We're seeing a few false here. Again, interesting, because then we can come over here to the assessment and we can see, okay, well, what did it, what word did it use to create this score? Again, we're kind of seeing the word impossible show up here. Hmm. We're also seeing nice, great, good, quick, fair, worth, best, right? Positive words. Okay. So, all right, so should I see this movie? So how, in this case, how I'm determining whether you should see the movie or not is I'm gonna take an average of all the sentiment scores, and then if the positive score is higher than the negative score, I'm gonna say, okay, well, it seems to have a really good positive sentiment around it, so people should go see it. And if they're equal, I'm saying, okay, it's split, you know, take a chance, do what you wanna do. And if the negative score is greater than the positive score, I say, people don't like this movie, uh, don't go see it. So let's see what we get here. Oops. Okay, so our, our positive rating uh, average score was 0 0.2, and our negative rating score was negative 0 0.4. So I'm saying, people don't like this movie, don't go see it. But now, when I did this originally, when I did this talk, um, Mission Impossible just come out, and it was super popular, right? Didn't everybody, everybody liked it. I think it had like a crazy high Rotten Tomatoes score. So something, something has, this is not what we were expecting, right? We were expecting to say, people should go see this movie. So if this answer was not what you were expecting, really either way, you should go back and take a look at it, right? Data science is an iterative process, right? So let's, let's try this again, but let's remove some extra stop words. So let's remove, right, because we saw that impossible was really weighing down our scores. So let's remove that. Let's remove the movie title because the movie title in itself is almost like a stop word, right? It's not adding anything to the sentiment at all. It's just the title. It's just trying to describe what it is I'm trying to describe. So let's remove the movie title. 
Let's remove any like um, extra happy faces or sad faces. Then let's remove the words mission, again, because I had already done this in advance, so I knew some of the words that might be affecting it. So in this case, for some of those movie titles we had, I'm gonna remove mission, impossible, star, for a star is born, and first. So we're gonna, we're gonna create a list of stop words, and then we're gonna go through that same process of, again, of removing stop words with Spark. But in this time, instead of just taking kind of the default stop words that Spark has, we're gonna take this list and pass it in. So in this case, which I was kind of disappointed in, I thought that what it would do is take this list and the list of kind of normal stop words and kind of concatenate them together and put it together. It doesn't. It only, if you, you can use, either use the defaults or you can use your own list. Uh, so we are gonna get, in our next set, we're gonna get things like of and a and are still gonna be there, but I think it's okay. So again, we're gonna run through this process again. Okay. And we're gonna go through here. And so now, so we've removed all these, um, our new set of stop words, and then we're gonna use them. Again, we're gonna convert it to pandas, use the pattern uh, Python package to get the sentiment and to get the average. So now we're starting to see, so this is our set of negative tweets. So now we're starting to see, I think, what we were expecting, right? Here's a negative sentiment score of 0 0.7, and the assessment is, why is it 0 0.7? Because it had the word bad in it. No, but actually, unfortunately, if we look back at the original tweet, again, it's kind of interesting. Actually, what the person is saying is, I want to see Mission Impossible so bad. So that's not, that's not really a negative sentiment, and it's not really a negative movie review per se, but nevertheless, we see why the Python package rated it this way, and it makes sense. And we're not seeing those very negative scores based on the words impossible. And then some of these here we see, we're getting 0.0. It's because it just doesn't, Python just doesn't understand. It doesn't know how to rate this. Okay, so let's go to our positive ones. Again, we're gonna convert to pandas and use pattern to get the sentiment and then take the average. Okay, so this, now we did better before, before we moved the Mission Impossible stop words, but now we're starting to see, again, uh, we're seeing more positive because it's not being weighed down by that impossible keyword. So we're seeing things like free, awesome, amazing, totally loved, <laughs> yeah, totally loved the action in Mission Impossible 6. That's a pretty good movie review. Okay, so let's see if there was a difference. So we're gonna do that same thing that we did before, take the averages. All right, so our original positive rating score was 0 0.2, and now our positive rating score is 0 0.3. Okay, which is, again, it's a little bit higher, but it's kind of making sense what we saw before. Our original negative rating is 0 0.4, and our, now our new negative rating is 0 0.15. Now things are starting to line up. Now things are making sense. So if we take the average of that and we compare them, we now see people like this movie, which makes sense. People like this movie. All right, so that's what the notebook is. So now, now we can all play with this ourselves on our laptop. So I hope everybody's ready. So let's go here. So what everybody wants to do is go here to GitHub and then it's slash um, my name, Amanda Moran, slash PyData. And what you can do is you can either just download it, uh, you can download zip and unzip it, or you can do a git clone from here. So I'll give everybody a second to do that, if you haven't already. And then come in here to your notebooks. And so what's um, actually something I just learned um, the other day is with Jupyter, so I have a notebook that I want you to look at to give you instructions, right? But you don't necessarily have Jupyter installed yet. So how do I let you see that Jupyter notebook? Well, actually, there's a very nice command in Jupyter that can convert it into an HTML file. So once you do your git clone, what I want you to do is actually just go and find that file. So let's, well, I'll go find that later. But so this one here, getting started.html, just double click on that and then it'll pop it up. You can also just look at it from GitHub, either way. Oh, but it doesn't show it here nicely. Okay, backtrack that. 
yeah, definitely double click and open it up. So once you have that onto your laptop, then we're going to install Docker. So I'll give everyone a second to get all level set on that. I'll make this larger. So if you don't already have Docker installed on your laptop, we'll need to do that. So, um, so you'll have to uh, download it from here. You want to use the community edition because the, uh, I think there's like an advanced enterprise edition, but you have to pay for that. So you can just get the enterprise edition. And I have a link in that notebook. And I think you do have to create a login to download. And then you'll download Docker. And that may take about five minutes or so. And then there's a few configurations that you need to change uh, in Docker once you get that installed. Does anybody already have it installed? OK. Oh, cool. cool. How long did it take about? 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, OK. Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, and then we have to download the DSE image, so that's going to take a little bit of time, too. And feel free, I'm kind of walking through this um, as we go along, but feel free to just jump ahead and keep going, or if you have questions, just raise your hand and... But did everybody get to GitHub OK? Cool. So this all takes a little bit more time with like downloading and things like that, but way less time in installation because originally I had us actually installing uh, data stacks and Spark uh, from our tire file. Uh, and this is much easier. <laughs> so anybody that already has Docker installed, <clears throat> um, you have to allow for five gigs of memory container. So you just go into, now uh, I have a Mac. So if anybody's on Windows, I'm, I'm sure it's similar. Um, I don't actually know, though. But you go to Docker, Preferences, and Advanced, and then there's a memory setting. And you just slide that over to 5. But if you're not there yet, don't worry. We have plenty of time. So then once you have that configured, or even if you don't have the memory configured yet, but the next step is that you're going to actually, and I'll show this from my terminal. You're going to open up a terminal, and you're going to go to where you actually downloaded those, uh, downloaded the notebooks. So in my case, it's my path and then PyData. And so from there, I'm going to do a Docker Compose. I think it's up D. I always get those swapped. And then that's actually going to pull the image from Docker. And that takes about five minutes. So then you just hit enter. So I'll just go ahead and do that. Oops. Live demo. 
Did I swap it? Okay, yeah. So from there, you'll do a Docker Compose up dash D. And so you can see here, I've already pulled those images. So we're going to have a DSD image and a Jupyter image. And so mine are already up to date, so it didn't do anything. But then once you get to this stage, then it's about five minutes. But after we get through that step, then we're able to pull up Jupyter uh, once those get started. So this is kind of the hard, tedious part right now, but then, then we'll be good to go. Is anybody having issues downloading Docker? Is everybody okay? How many people have used Docker in the room? Okay, cool. Okay. And so that Docker Compose up, not only will it download the images, but it'll also start them as well. So it's starting Datastax Enterprise, so basically Cassandra, it's starting Spark, and it's starting Jupyter. Has anybody got to the Docker Compose, the pulling the images yet? Is it coming down okay? Okay, good. Okay, okay, good. Um, from the terminal, so I'll show you again. So then you navigate into where you did your git clone. So this is mine here. So this is kind of small, sorry. Can you see that now? So then there's that Docker Compose file. So if anybody's interested, we can actually take a look at it. But that's where you'll run that Docker Compose dash D up. Yeah. So actually, it's utilizing this Docker Compose.yaml file to actually um, know what it needs to do. So it's saying, OK, I'm going to get the Datastax server image. I'm going to start it with a dash K. So basically, that says I want to start in an analytics mode. Then it just maps some ports. Uh, it accepts the license. Um, and then here's the Jupyter image. So actually, uh, this is an image that my boss created, which was nice. And uh, again, ma mapping those ports, Jupyter ports. And then it says, OK, uh, I want to use the notebooks from this location and, and uh, dock those and, so that we are able to use them in the Docker container. So once it pulls down the image, so I'm just kind of just repeating this as I go along. So don't, no one feel rushed. We still have plenty of time to go through this. Um, but kind of the trickiest part, I think, here is the fact that you need to use Docker to open up the logs so that you can actually get the token for Jupyter so that you can actually open it. So you'll see this once you get, get down to this point. But once it's downloaded and started, um, so you need to actually, to get that login token, you need to go right where you were, the same place where you did the pull from 
Docker logs and then the actual the name of the container, the Docker container, which in this case is pydata underscore Jupyter underscore one. And so from there, you're going to see some of the last things uh, that will print out of that log. It's just going to cat it to the, the terminal there. You're going to see this HTTP and then this long token string. So just highlight all of that. And then um, here, actually, I can, I can show you. So in this case, we're seeing mine actually has a lot of activity because I've actually been using it. But I think if we scroll back up here to the top, yeah, you should see copy and paste this URL into your browser when you connect for the first time. And so you see it has, uh, you're going to use localhost. So you want 127.0.0.1. So just highlight this whole thing or whatever yours is, right? Copy it and go back to your browser paste it in, and then get rid of all this extra that it provides. And I'll go through this again in a minute, like that. And then you should be able to get into Jupyter. But yeah, that's one of the, that's the most tricky part, yeah? Didn't you start the Docker uh, image first? No, it should, uh, that Docker Compose up should have started it. Should have. <laughs> Let me know if it did not. You can also do, um, I'll show you from here, docker ps, and that should show any containers that you have running. So hopefully you should see two, two containers. If you do docker logs, and then the pi data underscore Jupiter underscore one. Yeah, let me know if it, it works, hopefully. <laughs> Is it there? Okay, good. It's when the instructions that you write actually translate into what, what people are saying. So that's very good. I'm happy with that. So can I see like a show of hands who has Docker installed? Okay, good, good, great, good progress, nice. And so everyone's working on just getting that image downloaded now? Cool, okay, great. You should be, there's, there's Docker for Windows. Yeah, but that's only for professional enterprise examples. Oh, really? There's no community edition for Windows? Not for the home edition, at least. Oh. Yeah, if there's not the community edition, then I'm thinking, I'm surprised, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense that unlikely that someone would be using Docker on their home PC, but nevertheless, I mean, but everybody else is able, yeah. Okay. And then sadly, so I could say, okay, well, we could go a different route and you could do, you could just install DSC, but you can't install, it's Linux based, so. So that's when you share with your neighbor. <laughs> Work on it together. So one of the interesting things is if you forget to, to modify the memory for the containers, which um, 
I just did the other day. I completely had forgotten about it. I had reduced the memory of my Docker containers because I didn't want to take up a bunch of memory. Um, so everything will work perfectly until you get to the Spark jobs. And Spark, because again, it's an in-memory analytics engine, it needs a lot of memory. So it just will just spin there forever <laughs> without enough memory. So I think this is pretty good for a Sunday morning, right? Interacting with Docker, Jupyter, Python, Spark. That's a lot of, that's a lot of different technologies all for one early morning. Has anyone been able to get the Ju or Jupyter login yet? Oh, cool, great. And so then once you, if you do have Jupyter pulled up, then that's when you can navigate to the notebook and you can start kind of playing with it yourself. So here if you're in your, I can make this larger, this home directory, you can see when Rotten Tomatoes isn't enough and that's, uh, the, and I called it CSV because it's utilizing those CSV files. So yeah, I think definitely the most fun part we just be kind of walking through each one of these cells yourself and really making sure you understand what's going on in each one and also uh, tweaking the movie title. So you can see if you're getting, I think the most interesting part is seeing those assessment scores and those final scores on all these different. Uh, so we saw something very interesting with Mission Impossible because it was utilizing that impossible word and that was kind of skewing our results. But then we'll see if we're kind of seeing that with any of the other ones. Are the images, are, is it coming through okay? It's downloading?
Well, I'll just remind everyone that Jupyter URL is located inside that Docker log file, which is here. So if you go to, if you go here to your terminal and you docker logs and then the name of the container, so in this case it's pydata underscore Jupyter underscore one, and that it'll just, it'll just print out to your screen. Yeah. Yeah, it's more of a log command, I guess, than a log file. I mean, it's a file inside the docker container, but. We're using a command to get to it as opposed to looking at, looking at it with VI or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It wasn't just right at the end. There had been activity. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. So the command would look like this. So you do docker logs and then the name of the container, then a pipe, and then grep, and then for token. Oh. Okay, well I had a token a few places here. But it should pop up a little bit better. Or we could do this. Still no. Oh yeah, there, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, that there. So, how many people have the image downloaded? Are other people just still waiting? It's just slow. Okay. So I think we'll do maybe another like seven minutes or so of people trying to get this uh, downloaded and working through it on your own. And then after that, we can kind of open it up for like com some questions. Yeah. So we don't have to feel so quiet <laughs> working away. And what's nice about this, which is different than some of the other events I do where we provide uh, clusters to folks, is that those go away. <coughs> uh, this you can have forever and you can continue to play with it whenever you have free time.
show you this uh, other notebook that actually pulls the tweets live, and I can show you. I can walk you through kind of just the difference here. So here it's basically the same type of setup, except I'll show you the differences. So again, we have our search terms, right, which again, like I said before, with the happy face and the smiley face, or the sad face, that actually pull from Twitter. So we need those search terms. And then in this case, we also have a way to clean up the tweets, because we have to be able to strip out any emojis or flags, or uh, I stripped out any URLs or the RT for retweet. And so this is where you need to actually get that Twitter API dev account set up, because what it'll do is it'll give you these consumer keys, uh, two keys uh, and two secret tokens. And so in this case, I've, um, you can just copy and paste them here, um, but I've decided uh, that I've kind of hidden them in my environment variables so that I don't have to change them so no one can see them. Uh, so you just set this here. And then you're able to make that authentication with these three lines here. And so then that actually authenticates you. And so then Twitter knows that it's you. And the reason actually I decided that we wouldn't sign up for this together today is because you actually have to submit an application. Um, it's pretty quick. Um, it's about five minutes. But nevertheless, you do have to say, OK, I'm only using this for personal use. I'm not using this in an enterprise account. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to use this data to do anything bad with it, that kind of thing. Uh, so you do have to fill out like this little application to get these, uh, these tokens. And actually, they've made it more strict over time. It used to be when I did this um, like last year, I just like basically just click, click, and I signed up, and they gave me these tokens. And now they're making it a little bit more rigorous, which makes sense. It's a very nice service that they're providing. Um, so then what we're able to do is we're actually able to pull. So we pull from Twitter here in this line of code. And so again, like, we're, like I said before, we're doing it twice because we're doing it for positive and negative. So we add our search term. Now this is using the Python package called Tweepy. And Tweepy is actually what's the Python wrapper around these API calls. And so once we, do, we enter in the search term, we say we want the language, we want only English in this case. And then I said count as 100. So again, when you're not paying for this uh, access to this Twitter API, you're just using the regular you know, non-enterprise version, um, it only allows you to pull so many at one time. So in this case, it only, it's only, I'm giving a max of 100 at one time. And so even if you, it gives you 15 polls per hour, I've found that even if I, if I keep like, you know, like I put it in a loop and I'm trying to get you know, 15 calls of 100, it doesn't actually work that way. They seem to kind of throttle you in the back end as well. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, you're able to pull some live data, which is very interesting. And so from there, in this case, I just I clean it up. I pass it to that cleanup function. And then um, I'm able to then insert it into the database. And that's what I do. And then I'm able to just take a select star and like look at it. So in this case, in this notebook, let me scroll up here. So here I put a uh, movie title. This one, it's not limited to how we did with the CSV. You can actually search for anything. I mean, in this case, you don't even really have to look for a movie title, right? You can just any kind of thing that you're interested in, something you know, new and exciting that's happening you want to search for and get the sentiment about it. Um, in this case, I just use movie titles just to make it you know, very uh, tangible. But you could really search for anything. But again, um, they are, it does live come from Twitter. So uh, if you're ever demoing this, be careful, because uh, those are live tweets, and they may have some language that you may not want everyone to see. So those CSV files that I created, I actually did pull from Twitter, but then I went through and I read each and every line to make sure that there wasn't anything inappropriate. So this, then from there, once we actually pull it from Twitter, everything is exactly the same as like what we've done before. It's just we're getting that live data that, in this case, we didn't. Sentiment's the same. Everything is exactly the same. So yeah, I definitely, if you haven't played with it before, I definitely suggest it's, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting data set that you can utilize. Um, you don't get a whole lot of data. It's not big data, like I said, because they kind of throttle you there. But it's something you, unique that, uh, that you can have, a new tool in your toolbox. So has everyone been able to get to the Jupiter pulled up?
cool. Okay, great. Good. So we have about 10 minutes left. So do we have any questions? Yeah. How does the Jupyter know um, which container and that is connected? Does it have uh, any configuration? In that, uh, Jup uh, that Docker Compose file. So that is. That docker .yaml, that's the configuration file. And then that Jupyter uh, container, so that was made from a, um, an image, so you can see here. So the image with all the uh, Python packages and, and all that was already created here and then pushed up into Docker. And so that's how we're able to pull it down. It already has everything there. That's right, yeah. And also, um, but the actual, so let me show you here. here. So we have Jupyter here, but we're making the connection into um, Datastax and Cassandra in this call here. Yeah, so because it, it makes it a little bit easier because it's localhost, right? So I just said, okay, connect to this Cassandra there. Um, but yeah, that's all you have to do. That's where the connection is. Any other questions that anybody has? I know everyone's probably still working away. Yeah? So the role of, of data stack enterprise here is in sort of facilitating the integration between Cassandra and Spark? Yep. You got it. Exactly. So it's like letting you use Cassandra as a back end for the data at Spark? Yep. Exactly. You said that better than I did. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's just that, so actually when I started at data stacks, so I worked a lot with Spark and Hadoop in the past, and I was asking my boss, I said, oh, okay, can I get a Spark cluster? And he's like, we don't have, what do you mean Spark cluster? I'm like, I, you said I could use Spark. You said I could, could use analytics. I want a Spark cluster and I'm going to connect the two. He said, no, 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 it's co-located. It's like, oh, Cassandra's the back end as opposed to HDFS. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of where I go back to. In this case, with this small amount of data on your laptop, it, you don't really need, I mean, you could use all kinds of different things. You could just use straight CSV file, you could use just a regular flat file. Uh, but this is just kind of showing, you know, you can imagine if you had an application at scale. This scales out to that. This is just a sample on your laptop. I'll ask, the, I'll ask you all a question. So I found pattern, and I thought that worked pretty well for the sentiment analysis. But is anybody aware of any other Python packages that would have done, done the job? If you don't know, that's OK, too. I'm just wondering. It seemed, to, it seemed to do exactly what I needed to. It gave that nice assessment of each word. But I'm sure there's, I mean, there's a lot of Python data science packages out there. OK. OK. Yeah, I should look into that one. Normally I get a lot of questions because uh, at the end of the, in the past when I've given this presentation, at the end I don't have us go back through where we remove the new set of stop words that include the movie. So then people get 
uh, because I, I didn't have time to add that piece in. And I thought it was pretty interesting how much it was like uh, giving some skew to the data, right? And uh, but people normally have a lot of questions about how you could go back there and how you could how you could fix that. But with Spark, it's really easy. You just add that list of stop words and it solves that for you. So I just ran through first man, and the positive rating score we got for that was 0 0.3, and the negative rating score was negative 0 0.1. So that was the first pass. So now I'm going to run through it again, removing that word first, and see if it has any effect. So let's see. And my uh, negative... Uh, number of tweets for first man is actually really small. I think it's only like seven tweets. I couldn't really find, there wasn't, people weren't saying negative things about it. Okay, the scores are pretty similar. Yeah, so that way, so when you had that, you'd want to make sure that wherever you're running pandas from, so be it your laptop or you, know, you want to make sure that you have the memory that you'll need to move that data set over. So it would just really depend on the size of your data set. Okay. And if it were a large data set, then you would either uh, make it only a smaller section of data at a time and run it through? And exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Or you'd make sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have more memory. <laughs> Yeah, but you could use something, you know, you wouldn't use your laptop for that. You would, you know, use like a server that you had at work or something like that. Yeah. The reason the notebook that has ways get, getting the tweets from is normally the same. Yeah, that one is in, that has actually where you can use your Twitter depth. The, that one is in more notebooks. Yeah. So if we don't have any more questions, I'm just going to post up here that, again, there's the more information, more links, so you can go learn more about these things if you have any interest. And then just to let you guys know, Datastax is hiring. So uh, we have a lot of job listings on our website. So feel free to, we don't have like a booth here today or anything like that, it's just me. Uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, feel free to apply online and then ping me and let me know and I can uh, get our recruiters going, but yeah. So we don't necessarily, we work on the database. So we don't do a lot of data science, um, but yeah, if this is something you're interested, you're interested in distributed systems. Also, we are a remote um, company. So you can, if you live here in LA, you can stay here in LA. Uh, our headquarters is actually in Santa Clara, but most people work remotely, so. So 
I'll wrap that up, give you guys just a few little bit of time back. And so thank you very much. I hope this was useful.